to let everyone connect and just make sure we're on the screen there. Wonderful, yes, so it looks like we're live now. So as always, I'll give everyone a few seconds to get the notification that we're live and join us. If you are joining us live, then do say hi in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Wonderful, yeah, so we are all live, brilliant. So welcome everyone to our latest My AS My Life Facebook Live. My name is Zoe Clark. I'm Senior Self-Management Programme Officer here at NAS, and I'm delighted to have two speakers today joining us. I'm joined by Professor Margaret Hall Craggs, who's Professor of Medical Imaging at UCL and Consultant Radiologist at UCLH. And we're joined by Margaret's colleague, Dr. Alexis Jones, who is Consultant Radiologist at UCLH. Hi, both of you. Thanks for joining. How are you both doing today? Thanks very much. Well, I might just have to correct you slightly. I'm a consultant rheumatologist, but I'm... <laughs> My apologies. I meant to say rheumatologist as well. I thought radiology on the brain. <laughs> well, that's the main theme of today. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's really helpful you were here to join us because um, we're going to have a presentation to begin with and then we'll be answering questions. So it's great you'll be here to answer the more clinical patient-based questions alongside Margaret's radiology knowledge. Anyway, it's a pleasure to be here, and I hope that we'll be able to um, give you know give people some useful information. Um, I did drag Alexis along because I am a radiologist, so I don't actually look after patients. I just image them, and Alexis is much more expert in actually helping to care for patients than I am. That's brilliant. It's a perfect combination for us, definitely. Um, so for everyone who's watching us, thank you for joining. I can see Kerry, Louise, Maxine, Sue are all joining. Hi, thanks, thanks for commenting as well. Um, so before I hand over to Margaret for the presentation, just to let everyone know um, the session will stay on the page afterwards and we'll also upload it to our My AS My Life webpage. So you can come back and watch the full session at any time if you can't join for the whole, the whole talk. Um, also, if you have any questions at all, please do pop them in the comments because we'll come back for a Q&A towards the end of the session as well. Um, so I think, shall I hand over to you, Margaret, for the presentation, then we'll come back for a chat afterwards. That's great. Oh, ooh, hang on, something happened there. Can you see my screen? Uh, I can't at the moment. Right, I lost, I, for some reason, I've gone and lost my, um, my share bit i've lost i've lost the wow. just just give me a moment and i'll it's because okay. i went to the show okay let's try again i'll let you know when we see it that's perfect i can see julia and mandy are joining us and gordon hi oh, right can you can you see the screen now you should be able to i hope ah yes perfect Excellent. Okay. So as, as um, Zoe said, I'm Margaret Horcrags. I'm a professor of medical imaging, and I do mainly musculoskeletal imaging at UCH. And I've been asked to talk today about magnetic resonance imaging in spinal arthritis, because MRI is now one of the main ways of looking at people with SPA. So why do we image SPA? I think it's for a number of reasons, and I'm just going to go through the main ones which is we do do it partly for disease diagnosis, because if you have an MR positive scan, it contributes to the diagnosis of non-radiographic axial spinal arthritis. Um, we do it to assess causes of pain, you know, what is driving your current pain. We uh, do it to see how much inflammation is present. Um, we ask, we answer the question, is my treatment working? And has my treatment stopped working? So those are all the things that we're interested in when we do um, imaging, particularly MRI. So at UCH, we do an awful lot of MRI, and that is partly because we, we have facilities to do it. And also because radiology works incredibly closely with rheumatology. And um, within that relationship, we have used imaging increasingly because um, I, I think we feel that it's highly informative for the care of our patients. Um, we also do a lot of imaging because our patients like it and we know that because we've had focus groups, particularly with our JIA patients, really like imaging because they say, well, it's concrete evidence that I have got something wrong with me 
they also say, I don't trust a clinician that just squeezes a joint and says it's painful and says that's disease. And also they say, if you have um, a questionnaire and it says, um, you know, score your pain, is it six or 10 or whatever? They say, well, is my six the same as your six? My six today is different from my 10 it was yesterday. So patients like it because they feel confident it really is reflecting their disease. Um, as I said, our clinicians use it more and more, I think in particular because it helps differentiate what is driving pain, what are the causes of pain. Um, and at UCLH, we have built a research program which is strongly related to clinical needs. You know, what do people want to know? So just going back to that thing about what can drive pain, um, which I think is the thing that is of interest to patients. Well, you can get more pain because you've got more inflammation in patients who are having flares. And also, for example, if treatment stops working, you can have pain because there's a chronic pain syndrome um, that is driving pain all over pain. And you can also have pain because there's biomechanical damage. And by that, we mean that there is structural damage, which um, because of the inflammation, you get structural damage to joints and then you get pain secondary to the structural damage rather than the inflammation. And all of these different sorts of pain require different treatment and management approaches. And imaging can help sort one out from the other, one cause from the other. So I'm just going to show you some pictures of what we see in patients with um, spondylarthritis. So this is an adolescent patient, and we know he's adolescent because he's got an immature sacrum. So this is the sacrum here. This is the back end of the pelvic bones. And these lines in the middle, those are the sacroiliac joints. This thing at the bottom here is the lower slumber disc. And in adolescence, they haven't joined all their bits of the bone together. So they have these lines left behind, which gradually disappear. So this is a patient with back pain. The question is, has he got a spondyl arthritis or has he just got a disc problem? And we know he has got spondyl arthritis. This is what we call the T1 image. And this is a stir image. And they're the backbone of imaging in sacroiliitis, for example. So on our T1, we've got an area that is too dark, that should be lighter. And on our stir image, we've got an area that's too bright. So that means that there is too much water at each of those sites, which is what we see in inflammation. So that is a fairly typical example of um, sacroiliitis, which supported the diagnosis in that patient. So in this patient, the question is, I've been on biologics, my pain's been great, and now it's recurring. What's going on? So these are the sacroiliac joints again. And what we can see is on this side, this patient has proceeded to bone fusion. So the joint should be there and it's completely gone. On this side, we've got lots of erosions. We've got lots of dark stuff that we call sclerosis and bright stuff that we call fatty change. And that's an example of bone healing. That's what bone does when it heals. But in addition, we've got some dark stuff here, which is bright on the stir. So this is active inflammation. So what's happened in this patient is they've got more pain because they've got more inflammation. And they didn't just have more inflammation in their sacroiliac joints, they've got it in their spine. So here we have a spine looking from the side. This is very straight, this bit. So this is the sort of typical bamboo spine. But if we look at just above there, we've got something that is dark on T1s, bright on our stir image. This is active inflammation in the spine. So again, this patient we found to have new active disease in the spine and new active disease in sacroiliac joints. So their treatment had stopped working basically. So I want to talk briefly about some of our research highlights because at UCLH, we have been researching in SPA um, in terms of imaging for about 15, 20 years now. So what have we found along the way? So I'm just going to choose four little things that we've done. So one of the things we showed was that in adolescents, adolescents proceed to fusion of their sacroiliac joints, irrespective of successful biologic treatment. So even if you have really good biologic treatment, gets rid of your pain, makes you feel better, it doesn't stop your sacroiliac joints fusing. We also have found that enthesitis itself can cause pain, but if you don't give contrast enhancement when you're imaging it, you don't see it. We have lots of women in particular 
who've had spinal pain and we, they've had scans in the past show nothing. We've done scans and seen rip roaring spinal emphysitis. And they have, and that's, they've actually had spondylarthritis all this time. So this is another thing we've shown. The other thing we've shown is that you can measure inflammation quantitatively. That means you can actually put a number on it and the number means something. So if you have 10 and five, if you take 10 from five, you've got an answer five, which is a proper five. It doesn't mean that you've taken an apple from an orange. And these color coded response maps can be used to convey information about how well people are responding to treatment. And the other thing we've done is we've just done a big study in JIA, juvenile, idiopathic arthritis, and we've done whole body imaging in those patients, and we've studied something like 65 patients, and we have found that a lot of these adolescents have disease which is completely clinically unsuspected. So people walk around with big inflammatory burdens that we never know about. So just going back to, through them in more detail, so this is in adolescence, fusion of the sacroiliac joints can occur despite biologic treatment. So this is a series of images we've acquired through time. So these first two at the top, this is when our patient presented. And at that time, he's got lots of white stuff on the stir, lots of bone marrow edema. This is very active sacroiliitis. And this continued before he started treatment. So he's, he was in a pretty bad state at that stage. So he was put on biologic treatment. And with the biologics, what you can see is that the inflammation, which is dark on this area, has disappeared and fat has reappeared. So fat is a feature of bone healing. So he had lots of inflammation and it's beginning to heal. Now, despite the fact that all of that inflammation has disappeared. Look what happens to his sacroiliac joints where he had all of that disease and all of those erosions. There you can see big erosions on either side of the joints. And the next time, two years later, the erosions are beginning to fill in with bone. And then by three years, he's got bone crossing joint, more bone, four years, bigger bits of bone, five years, even bigger bits. So you can see that he's now got, he's lost his sacroiliac joints. So he has gone on to fusion, despite the fact that the biologics have controlled his pain, have controlled the inflammation, the, the fusion has just gone on. So that's something that we showed. As I said, the other thing that we do is we give a lot of contrast enhancement with our MR scans, and that shows us areas of enthesitis. Now, enthesitis, I'm sure you all know, but I'll just go through it again. Enthesitis occurs where you have a ligament or tendon inserting into bone, and it's at that interface you can get inflammation. So you get inflammation of the ligament itself, and you also get inflammation of the bone. And if you don't get contrast, you don't see that. So we give contrast a lot, and we see much more enthesitis than really we would expect to find just looking at the literature. So this is a patient who actually had spinal inflammation, but he also had a painful knee, but without a big, without any significant amount of fluid on board. So he had this apparently non-swollen, but very painful knee. So we gave him some contrast. And what you can see, this is a slice through the knee. Um, the kneecap would be at the front. And then this is the bone of the, of the upper leg at its far end, just before we get to the knee. And what we can see here, this is called the medial collateral ligament. It's a ligament and it's surrounded by this bright stuff, which is bone marrow edema. This is active inflammation. This is rip roaring enthesitis. In the same patient, there should be seen here a big black ligament called the posterior cruciate ligament. And we can hardly see it because it's so bright. And then where it inserts into the femur, there's another area of bright in the bone. So this is bone marrow edema. Again, this is rip roaring enthesitis. And on his standard scan, you couldn't see that. You have to give contrast. So he went from having a painful but undiagnosed knee to having a knee that shows florid enthesitis. So this is the other thing that we're interested in doing. We are trying to promote a technique called quantitative MRI, which, as I said, means that you give meaningful numbers to, to a feature, whether it's the amount of fat, um, the relaxation time of water. And if you have a number, you can start to manipulate them. You can 
segment them, you can add them, you can subtract them, you can do all sorts of things with them. And what we have done is we have made color coded maps, response maps. So what we do is we take an image before treatment, an image after treatment, and as I said, we can subtract them directly because they are numbers. And, when, and then you can give the numbers colors. So this is an example of a patient. These are the sacroiliac joints, and this is before treatment. This is a T1 image, so you can see there's lots of dark stuff. This is lots of inflammation. They have treatment, and that dark stuff becomes bone healing, which we see as a huge area of fat. And then if we take one from the other and then color code the numbers, we can see a big area here that's improved, that's green, green is good. Um, these red areas are actually blood vessels, so you ignore them. Um, and so what it means in this patient is that we've gone from rubbish to really good. Lots and lots of nice green stuff, this is getting better. And I think that if you code things in red and green, it's very, and, and then show anybody, whether it's a clinician, whether we show patients, whether we show their relatives, whether we show other doctors, if we say green is good, red is bad, it's very easy then to understand whether you're getting better or worse. You know, is my treatment making me better? Ooh, there's less red than there was last time. There's more green. It's a very, very easy way to understand what's going on. So the other thing we've been doing is this whole body imaging. And as I said, we've found that whole body imaging in JIA uncovers unsuspected disease. So this is a whole body scan. In fact, there's a little bit missing in the middle because we lost some scans of a patient, a, a woman who had no symptoms at all. She was completely asymptomatic. And yet what we found was she's got, these are contrast enhanced scans. The bad stuff is the very bright stuff. I mean, that's a heart in the middle. So um, that's a good these are the shoulders here and here, but you can see they're surrounded bright, bright stuff, more bright stuff. So this is active inflammation in the shoulders. These are the hands, you can see the fingers there. And these are the wrists, bright, 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 more bright, loads of bright, 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 lots of inflammation in the hands. And then she had inflammation, bright stuff in her elbows, those were her kidneys. And this is obviously a foot, lots of bright stuff in what we call hind foot, the ankle joint, the subtalar joints, the calcaneotavicular joint, the navicular cuneiforms. Oh, it's in the metatarsal, um, metatarsal joints. Oh, there's more in the forefoot. Oh, and there's even inflammation in the toes. No symptoms was thought to have no inflammation at all. Now she actually needs to be treated because this inflammation will go on to damage her joints. So again, imaging was really, really important in her. So what are we going to do on the future? Well, we're going to continue to develop quantitative imaging. And I've put here, I could bore you for hours about why this is better than qualitative imaging. And this is an example of the quantitative imaging that we're developing. This is what's the T2 map. And it contains in it very similar information to the STIR image, except you get better quality image and it's full of numbers. So you can start to subtract these. And also you can start to compare one scan with another scan. You can compare between scanners. So it's a very, very useful tool. So the other thing that we're do, doing is we're using AI to assess and measure inflammation on images. Because if you use AI, you can get, AI can deal with much larger volumes of data than we can as people. You can then um, start to develop um, sort of almost like encyclopedias, you know, what's normal bone, what is abnormal bone, all with numbers. Um, you can speed up how you interpret the scans. You can also then get it to automatically subtract. So you will automatically generate those response maps. Um, and you will get more consistency between readers. If you take one radiologist and another radiologist, depending on their experience and whether they've had lunch or not had lunch, you may get completely different answers. If you use AI, you get a much more consistent answer than if you use people, as long as you train it properly. And this is, this is 
also an, another example of AI. In this um, example, what we've done is we've used AI and machine learning to segment bone out of an image. So here we've taken um, an image and uh, told it what is normal bone and abnormal bone, and it's actually managed to segment out the whole of the sacrum. Um, and then on top of that, you can get it to segment out the inflamed bit of the bone. And so you then have a, an automated tool for working out how much inflammation is present. So the other thing that we're very interested in is clinically translating this work, i.e. getting it into clinical practice where people can actually use it and patients can benefit from it. Now, my areas of importance in terms of clinical translation is to get whole body imaging as we have developed at UCH into clinical practice. And I said, let's stop guessing if inflammation is there, let's actually try and demonstrate it. We also want to go on developing quantitative imaging because I think if you measure disease properly, you can then influence treatment in a better way. And by developing response maps, we give people and patients and doctors a much better way of understanding whether inflammation is getting better or worse. Green is good, red is bad. And the other thing we want to do is work out if imaging actually affects clinical treatment decisions. We've done some preliminary work with whole body imaging and the JIA cohort, and that suggests that actually it does. If you give people more information, they do change their decisions and they feel they've changed them for the, for the better. So that's what we're up to at the moment. I just want to talk about um, research and clinical teams, and they are real teams, they are multidisciplinary, and we cannot survive and work effectively without each other. And in the team I work in, we have radiologists, we have medical physicists, we have rheumatologists, including Alexis, who kindly is with us today. We have people working in computer science, and they work with our machine learning and our artificial intelligence stuff. And of course, we have our patient groups, and they are absolutely critical because they tell us what's important. They also tell us if we design a study that it's not going to work because they wouldn't dream of having 49 scans in six months, not a hope, don't do it. Um, and, and, and we really do value their, report, their support. In fact, Alexis has also worked with NAS groups doing questionnaire work. So we, um, we value and appreciate our patient groups. So just finally, any questions? questions for either me or Alexis. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> that is a wonderful thank you. That was so information packed and really fascinating. Uh, we've got lots of people watching live and, and questions coming in as well. So I, I can tell everyone's found it really interesting. Thank you. Um, first question that would probably be good to, to go with, we've had a couple of questions about enthesitis in particular. Um, and someone's asked, um, is enthesitis permanent damage? So maybe if you want to just briefly explain that, that process again of kind of the inflammation and whether it leads to damage. Um, well, there's, I think there's different types of enthesitis. There's enthesitis, for example, where you have a muscle going to a tendon joining a bone. And the enthesitis in those patients is, can be transient. They seem to get an acute inflammation and it settles down. But if you have enthesitis that's associated with something like a sacroiliac joint or facet joints, it can combine with inflammation in the joint, which can lead to fusion. So it can be a real problem. It's not so much a problem in sacroiliac joints, but as you know, if people have ankylosis of their spine and get a very, you know, enthesitis can result in, is one of the, the things that, contributes towards people having that bamboo spine, the inflexible spine. I mean, what, what would you say, Alexis? Yeah, I think it's due to sort of the longevity of how much, the, how long, you know, the inflammation there. So if you have the acute episode of enthesitis, that shouldn't cause permanent damage. But obviously with time, if that inflammation continues, then you get calcification, this process of calcium and hardening. Um, and then you can get, as Margaret talked about, fusion and particularly in the spine that can cause secondary mechanical pain um, and all sorts of other issues. So it's, it's due to how long that inflammation is allowed to you know, be there um, in terms of whether it causes long-term damage. That's really helpful, thank you. Um, and I suppose a lot, along those lines, um, Lynn asked, how often should you have an MRI? So this is probably more a clinical question for Alexis. 
and probably one that has a thousand different answers. Yeah, there's there's no specific sort of way of, a, you know, timetable in which you should have an MRI scan. And it, it still, it does, MRI scans are fantastic, but they do need to be put into a clinical context and with clinical questions. So um, we're not at the moment in the, you know, we don't do surveillance MRI scans, but what they are very useful for is patients who have persistent pain despite treatment. Um, it can help differentiate what is inflammatory, what is mechanical, um, and it's answering specific questions. Um, we are starting to use MRI a bit more to assess response to treatment in combination with clinical symptoms as well, to just get a bit more robustness to um, you know, disease activity, but we, we're not in we're not in doing regular MRI scans on everyone at the moment. I think there's very few cases where um, regular imaging is appropriate. I, I think one of the few situations where regular imaging is appropriate is, for example, um, in cancer, um, where you're trying to, you know, for example, breast screening. Someone has had breast cancer, then they have regular follow up. And that's because um, you know, you know that a reasonable number of people will get a recurrent tumour and you know that if you treat it early, they've got a much better outcome. So there's sense for screening there. Um, but in fact, in, in spondyloarthritis, you, you're answering questions, you're using it to troubleshoot, to answer questions. So you wouldn't want to do it just because someone's absolutely fine. You know, why do it? You know, you do it when there's a problem. You know, why have I got new pain? you know, I, my back's fine, but I've now got a new pain in my knee. You know, what's going on in my knee? Is it because I've torn a meniscus or is it because I've got new inflammatory disease in the knee? The other thing is that we do do a lot more imaging, as I said, at UCLH than they do in other centers. Um, and in fact, it's one of these odd things that the more you do, in fact, the more you appreciate it because you, you begin to understand where it slots in. Um, and you just have to think back to about, you know, sort of, 40 years ago where people used to come in with acute abdomens someone would feel their tummy and say yes we'll do an operation or no we won't do an operation and now you can't move through casualty without having at least 10 scans so that people really understand what's going on and I think that's beginning to happen now in in rheumatological imaging people want the information absolutely yeah it's amazing how far we've come in such a relatively short space of time um, my, my motto is the guessing has got to stop. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I'm so mean. <laughs> um, and I suppose along similar lines, we've had a question about um, in terms of the full body scanning, because um, obviously you've used that as part of your research. Is there a specific time clinically when this would be used? Is that more for widespread pain? You know, it's not going to be something that, that is just part of, you know, a general checkup, is it? I don't know who'd like to take that. <laughs> The whole body imaging. I mean, I, I think Margaret might need might be better place to um, talk about this, but I think essentially at the moment it's in its it's in its in, we're researching it. I think to have a look at how much really clinically we we miss um, essentially in terms of inflammation to guide uh, future sort of management. Um, I mean, I think there is a chance, particularly for the population group of JIA, that whole body imaging could be um, could be used more regularly, just because there are so many joints to assess, um, and we know that if we can keep disease in remission um, and treat it early, um, then we can improve outcomes. So, uh, at the moment, I think it's more of a research stage, but potentially in the future, we might we might end up using it more regularly. I think for the adult patients. Um, their disease tends, if it's more limited to the axial skeleton, then we would probably do more MRI and sacroiliac joint imaging rather than whole body, but it is more useful in the JIA group. Mm. So I think I, I, we, we were very surprised how much disease we found that no one was expecting. Um, and we're writing that paper up at the moment. Um, but uh, as Alexis said, this is in a, a younger group and it's not, it's not the patients who've got the SPA type disease. Um, although we had them in our research cohort, um, they, they got, um, they had unsuspected hip disease, 
but it's the number of adolescents who had really unsuspected disease in their hands and feet you know that was very very surprising because you'd have thought that those are things that you can examine easily clinically but in fact they had a lot of disease that was not suspected and I think that's the, that's essentially the take home message that we want to make is that you know clinically we can only do so much and actually we need other tools to help inform us to manage patients clinically and we've you know as rheumatologists we do pride ourselves on you know examining our patients carefully but there is you know there, are, there is only so much you can do, and particularly in the spine, it can be so hard to assess patients clinically, uh, particularly if they've got mechanical back issues, they've got had a history of chronic pain because the, maybe their disease has been left uncontrolled. So it, it, the take home message of a lot of our research is essentially, you know, there's a lot of information to be gained by imaging patients appropriately and, and potentially a bit, a bit more regularly. Absolutely, and I, I imagine we get a few questions from people who perhaps have a lot of widespread pain or a lot of spinal pain but then the scans come back all clear from the information so i suppose then clinically would that then be something that you've mentioned in terms of maybe mechanical pain or you know chronic pain rather than active inflammation yeah and i think even though people's scans can come back as normal it can be incredibly helpful because part of a fear when you have chronic pain is you don't know what's going on and you don't know how much of it is inflammation and, and is my disease being managed or is it actually something else and there's lots of you know secondary pain phenomenon and, and the management is totally different and as a clinician it can be very hard to detect you know to decipher what is inflammation and what what could be chronic pain and these scans inform both the patient and the clinician and can help direct that management route a lot a lot more clearly um, than just sort of a, a clinical assessment but they, they do have to be used together but it, it's just about gathering information and I think patients find it reassuring to know that there's not something you know going on um, on their MRI. Absolutely that can be so valuable even just having that reassurance can make a big difference and um, moving away from from the management side a little bit more onto diagnosis we did have a question before the session asking can you get a conclusive diagnosis of axial spar from an MRI? Um, I don't know who'd like to jump on that one. <laughs> well, that's really a clinical thing, but I mean, basically, it, it's it's a whole bunch of stuff that makes the diagnosis. It's no one definite test. Yeah, so while we're big advocates of imaging, it all has to be taken in a clinical context, and the clinical history is is it fundamental? Um, so you can't make a diagnosis just on a on a scan. And we do actually have. We've also done some research looking at how some patients can have some abnormalities that can mimic some findings of spondyloarthritis, and they don't have any history suggestive of inflammation. So the answer is you you can't just diagnose on a scan. It has to be taken into a clinical context. Okay, brilliant. Um, and just, I think our final question actually um, is more of a technical question. Lynn asks, um, is an open MRI as effective as a closed MRI? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Complete bugbear of mine. No, open, open MR scanners just don't work so well for lots of technical reasons. They're much bigger bore. Um, they might tend to be much lower, um, the, lower uh, strength magnets. And you just get a blurry image. I mean, they are so rubbish and people go to them and, you know, oh, I've got my open scan. And I sort of think, well, you may as well just throw it in the bin. Um, I mean, really, they are so rubbish. Uh, please don't go there. You know, <laughs> if, if you don't want to have a scan, take some diazepam, get someone to sleep, have a proper scan. Otherwise, you may as well, you know, I know, eat a few Smarties. <laughs> Waste of time. <laughs> That was a very definitive answer. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm just going to have a look for any other questions. Um, so for anyone watching, any burning questions, get them in now, because um, we're sort of coming towards the end of uh, the session. I know Alexis has got to dash off to another meeting. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else either of you would like to, to share with anyone who's watching. Um, I mean, it's been so information packed already. Thank you both. It's been a pleasure being with you and thank you for inviting us. It's lovely. Oh, you're welcome. 
yeah, so I think we've covered everything um, and I'll keep an eye on the questions over the next few days as well. So if anyone's watching it on catch up, um, I'll just keep an eye out if we've got any more questions being added. Um, so yeah, I'll just let everyone know who's watching about our next Facebook Live. Uh, next week on Tuesday, the 8th of March at 6 p.m., I'll be chatting with Catherine Bloomer and Joel Nelson, who are both people living with axial spar and uh, with psoriatic arthritis as well. Um, and we'll be chatting about family life and parenting with arthritis. Uh, so we'll be talking about their personal experiences. Um, yeah, so I'll just have a final check for any last minute questions. We've got a few thank, well, quite a few thank yous coming in. It's been a really popular session. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. Um, yeah, I think we've covered everything. So thank you both so much. And thank, thank you everyone you. for watching and joining in as well. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Bye then. Take care. Bye.